I remember it was September 2009. I was living in Gaziantep. There was a joint uh, cabinet meeting in Aleppo, the Syrian city in northern Syria. It was the first joint cabinet meeting of Turkish and Syrian governments, and I was there. I remember the euphoria about the friendship between Turkey and Syria. We were happy of and talking about a joint country, Syria, Turkey, uniting. And th there was a kind of motto. I remember Europeans have their Schengen visa and we have our Schengen visa. I'm sure you are familiar with this Schengen. Then, uh, becoming digested by that euphoria, I decided to live for a short time in Damascus in the following year and spent the summer of 2010 in Damascus. It was, I think, the last stable summer of Damascus. And especially during weekends, we were hiring a cab to visit Beirut. I'm not sure right now, but I think it took, it takes a couple of hours from Damascus to Beirut. While driving this road, it was very interesting, a kind of biblical, the heart of Middle East, passing through different villages, very interesting natural areas. And there were some, I remember, villages speaking with different, somehow, pre-modern languages. But on the other hand, we were counting Turkish flags, you know. And uh, again, it was the same euphoria. I witnessed during the joint cabinet meeting of Turkey and uh, Syria in Aleppo in September 2009. After three and four years almost, now look at the change, how it is dramatic to us. We used to talk about creating a visa-free region with Syria, maybe to include Iraq, you know, Libya and Egypt, but right now, ironically, in terms of Turkish foreign policy, toppling Assad is the number one target for whole Turkish foreign policy. So why did it happen and how it's affecting Turkey? I'm a political scientist. When I analyze an issue, we come up with certain questions. The first question is, what is this? There are many answers to these questions. But if we take from the beginning the whole Arab Spring, which is a misnomer, which is not correct, it's not an Arab Spring, what is this? This is a critical question that gives some clues that makes us strong to analyze the things, the dynamics. If people are jumping into the streets to change for a regime, and I'm sure you are all familiar with the motto, a shab, yurid, al iskhat and nizam, which means that people want to change, to topple down their regimes, it is called in political science a revolutionary process. So from the very beginning, what we have in the Arab Middle East was a revolutionary process. But there's a simple question. If you read the literature, there are different revolutionary process which failed. So in the Arab Spring case, what we have is a failed revolutionary process. It's very dangerous because when people start for a revolutionary process with the aim of changing their governments, when they fail, automatically the whole process turns to become a kind of state destruction mechanism. Right now, when we look at the map, imagine Ukraine, it's a state collapse. There is no stable Ukrainian government. It's de facto partition state between Russia and local Ukrainian uh, government. How about Georgia? It's a state collapse. How about Egypt? It's almost a state collapse. Maybe it's not like other Arab states, but economically and from other perspectives, it's a very poor state. Let me give you a number. Almost Turkey's and Egyptian populations are equal, but Egyptian economy is only one third of Turkish GDP, which means that it's a very poor. If you go to Cairo, if you go to slum parts of Cairo, you see millions of people living in a very, very bad economic conditions. So it's almost a very, very, it, it, it almost resonating a kind of state collapse, just like in other Arab states. What about, I talk about Libya. I think it's been three or four times the Libyan prime minister was hijacked by different groups in Libya because de facto Libya is a, again a coalition of tribes right now to replace the modern state over there. In the same way Iraq, there is no more Iraqi case. In 2008 I was in Afghanistan and in a kind of interview with a local person and asked the question, what do you think about the performance of Karzai? You know the Karzai, he was at that time the president of Afghanistan. And the reaction was, 
we have no idea about Karzai because he's the governor of Kabul. He's not our president because Karzai at that time was only sitting in Kabul, supervising the you know his daily agenda and had very very weak connections with other part of Afghanistan. It's the same story about Iraq right now. There is an Iraqi president in Baghdad sitting in his office in Baghdad, but I don't think he has any capacity to change any kind of pattern or you know any kind of political process in other parts of Iraq. So. These all different tables show us what we have seen so far. Part of the Arab Spring is the failure of states. That is very critical for us to understand how things are affecting and are going to affect Turkey because it is the, one of the most scary things that may happen in any kind of political setting, state collapse. That is why we have these Jepat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, and other groups because when states collapse, the only way is they give way to their sub-state groups as these kind of terrorist organizations. So this is the first point. Syria is a state collapse, which means that what we have in Syria right now is a new coalition of different groups. And there is no doubt, on the other hand, it is a sectarian problem. Because we have the experience of Bosnian war, we have the experience of any other multi-ethnic example. If a multi-ethnic state collapse, it turns to be a kind of federalist model. I'm not talking about a successful federal model as we observe in Scandinavian countries or somewhere else in Europe. It's a kind of pathological federalism as we have in Iraq. Technically, it's a federalism. So most probably, what we are going to observe is a kind of federalist model in Syria. You cannot imagine reuniting Syria after observing hundreds of thousands of people left their homes killing each other. So this is called pathological federalism. And in a sectarian violence, a pathological federalism is inevitably to affect its neighbors, and we are all affected by that in that case. In that case. Again, I remember an Iranian scholar, uh, maybe technically I may call him an Iranian mullah working for the Iranian government. Once in a sp I was listening to him in a speech in a conference, he told me that we will defend Damascus as we defend, we are going to defend Tehran. It's very critical to understand how sectarian dynamics affect Syrian problem. We are, we are going to defend Damascus as uh, we, uh, we, we will defend Tehran. Because from the classical perspective of Shia ge uh, geographical thinking, Damascus is a very key position to defend Iranian regime. The same scholar from Tehran also told me that since the Iranian revolution, it is the most critical resistance we are giving to the global system to protect our regimes. I should remind you that when Khomeini came out in 1979 after the Islamic revolution, I think it was first Russia or uh, Assad's father, Assad Syria, recognized officially Iranian state, the Islamic state. So it's a sectarian problem. How it is affecting us, first of all, Independent of Syrian problem, Turkey has its own sectarian tension. If I may say, it is a kind of problem that hibernates. This, this infamous or you know, uh, unwanted thing that we never want to raise in public, but the tension between Turkey, Sunni, and Alawite communities. That's a problem which has not been solved so far. For example, Sunni Muslims are practicing, you know, enjoying the privileges of having thousands of mosques in Turkey. Their salaries are paid by state. How about the rise of Alawite people? So Turkey has its own tension of sectarian issue in, uh, here for more than decades. So, so I'm not saying that Syria is creating a sectarian problem in Turkey, but it has a capacity to negatively affect what we have already here. How it is affecting? The first point is it has become a signaling mechanism. In comparative politics, we use this signaling mechanism means that uh, signaling means that some, some dynamics become to produce frequent or regular signals about a problem. So whenever you read something about Syria, it is giving a message about your sectarian identity. And Syrian problem is a sectarian issue, no doubt. I, I, I did say it's about a main problem that came out, that created by a failed revolutionary process. That's true. But on the other hand, it's a problem about sectarian debate. So for Turkey, for Turkish larger public, it's a sectarian issue, a signaling mechanism. And if you read Syrian problem from an Alawite perspective, you get different messages and signals. And if you read the case from a different Sunni perspective, from a different, uh, you get the different meaning. And it is now somehow affecting these ongoing Sunni and Alawite 
difficult relationship in Turkey. The second point is, it has a meaning in terms of sectarian, uh, from the same sectarian perspective, but in meaning at foreign policy level. For long decades, Turkey used to have a certain distance with, the dif with different countries. Certain distance means that Turkey has approached Egypt, Iraq, Syria, and other Middle Eastern states, keeping that distance. In fact, that distance was the main dynamic that gives Turkey's capacity of acting as a soft power. But after the Arab Spring, Turkey has made a dramatic change about that keeping, keeping that distance. So instead, try to directly influence playing with some actors. For example, we are all familiar that, to a large extent, we supported, our government supported, uh, Turkish government supported Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. But if you start to play through one group in another country, it, start, it, it automatically creates some problems because there is no state in the Middle East that is homogeneous. In every state, there are different groups. For example, there is a strong secular community in Egypt. In the same way in Lebanon, for example, typical multi-ethnic state of Middle Eastern countries. So during this Arab Spring period, that distance to a large extent has become very weak. When you visit, for example, Yemen, I visited Yemen, I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine, uh, understand how such a strong reaction I observed from different intellectual groups in Yemen because some of them believe that Turkey is supported, even some of them believe that Turkey send some kind of weapons to different groups in Yemen. So some intellectuals in Yemen believe that Turkey is the source of instability in Yemen. So this is about losing that distance part of the Arab Spring, which is critical from the sectarian perspective because the diminishing of that distance creates a Sunni state image to Turkey in foreign policy. If you visit any Western capital, if you, visit, if you happen to speak with any intellectual from Western academia, most people would say that now you are acting as a kind of Sunni state, as a, trying to become a leader of the Sunni countries, which is somehow critical uh, to a critical uh, point to understand the negative impact of Syrian crisis in terms of sectarian tension in Turkey. What else? The third point is, I told you about failed states, failed borders. Again, please imagine the map. There is a failed geography from Afghanistan passing through northern Pakistan. There is the Waziristan, South Waziristan, which there is no virtual state control as well over there, and including some part of Iran, Turkey, and Georgia, and finally, these Arab countries. So this big geography with many failed states means that failed borders. We have a border with Syria which is longer than almost 900 kilometers. Can you imagine how much money you need to protect that border? Can you protect that border? You need manpower. You cannot protect. That is why we have NATO patriots from different countries, from Netherlands and USA, that they are protecting part of NATO, our boundaries. So what is the meaning of these failed boundaries? Failed boundary means that drug uh, smuggling, oil smuggling, and also different groups, transnational groups. Groups are transnational. For example, before the Syrian problem, the Kurdish problem was to a large extent a Turkish problem. But right now, the, uh, right now, the Kurdish, if I may say, the PKK, three cantons in Syria, which means that, again from a sectarian and ethnic perspective, through Syrian problem, now Turkey is facing a different Kurdish problem. It is transnational. Before the Arab Spring, PKK was almost a kind of Turkish, Turkish, not an ethnic, but geographically Turkish organization. But right now in Afrin, in famous or infamous Kobana, now there are three Kurdish cantons. So this crisis transformed the dimension of Kurdish problems so far as to have three independent cantons in including uh, some areas in Syria. This is mainly about border security. So can you protect that border? There is one simple fact. If you have a 910 kilometer border with another state, you cannot protect that unless there is another stable regime on the other side of the border that is ready to cooperate with you, just like the American and Canadian border. Otherwise, it is de facto a failed border. So this is another case that is uh, likely to affect for a long time Turkey's uh, stability and Turkish foreign policy. I did talk about Kurdish problem. It is critical because I refer that PKK has become a transnational actor part of the Syrian crisis, 
But on the other hand, PKK itself is transforming. For example, if you compare the members of PKK headquarters before the Arab Spring and after the Arab Spring, now you see many Syrian origin guys in the headquarter, which means that it is becoming transnational beyond Turkey's control. Very interesting. That is why most scholars focusing on the Middle East today believe that it is no longer an Arab state, but it is a Kurdish spring. It is no longer an Arab spring, but it is a Kurdish spring. So from that perspective, uh, these new sectarian and ethnic dynamics are creating new uh, 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 structures which are likely to affect many countries, including Turkey, in the long term. How about economy? If I'm talking about the impact of Syrian crisis on the lives in Turkey, one point is economy. There are controversial dynamics about that. The first is, interestingly, part of the Arab Spring, economy and politics have become less interdependent, which is good. For example, if you look Turkey and Russia, they are different on many, all major issues. We are, they are different on Cyprus, they are different on Syria, they are different on Ukraine, so and so forth. But Russia has become the first or second major trade partner with Turkey, okay? Look at Turkey and Israel. They are different on major issues, but they are now almost doing very well in economic partnership. In Syria, we have the same story. Officially, Turkey's main strategy is a regime change in Syria, which is a revolutionary, because since its creation in 1923, Turkey has never had such a grand aim. It's the first time Turkey is trying for a regime change in another country, which is revolutionary, and which is creating long-lasting impact, psychological impact, not in Turkey, but in the whole region. It's the first time Turkey has an aim for regime change in another country, which is very, very critical in any rate at international level. But even Turkey's trade with Syria is going very well, mainly through local networks. So in terms of economy, the Arab Spring and the Syrian crisis, despite its many negative effects, creating a less interdependent networking mechanism and logic trend, uh, uh, between the actors. Finally, refugee problem. <clears throat> According to recent reports, I think the number of refugees in Turkey is more than a million. So can we call them still as a refugee? Million pe <coughs> a million people. In other words, I don't think traditional narrative or let's say vocabulary about refugees are enough to analyze the refugee problem. That is why many people now approach the refugee issue as a mass human exodus. What does it mean? Most probably, they will not go back. They will stay here. We are talking about millions of people. Now imagine a Syrian girl who left Syria when she was nine years old and spent four years in a camp. Now she is 14 years old. What is she? No longer Syrian. Because she was out of socialization circle. You happen to be born in a small village, you have a neighborhood, you go to a school, then you become Turk, Kurd, Muslim, Christian, whatsoever it is. But millions of people who left years out of Syrian socialization circle are no longer Syrians. So they are socializing with us. It's on the one hand good, on the other hand bad. We're gonna see both positive and negative repercussions of this very interesting phenomenon in the upcoming years. But very briefly, it is no longer a refugee problem. We cannot explain the, uh, the, the problems of millions of Syrian problems living in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey by using traditional refugee literature. <clears throat> there is a famous debate in social science, agent, structure debate. Agent means the actors, individuals, communities, and structure is the major dynamics that shape politics. I think, having observed what happened so far in the last year, we should add a focus on structure in the Middle East. What I mean by that, do you believe international community can solve Syrian problem in the following three or four years? It's almost impossible. So what is the solution? 
I think based on an agent structure debate, the only logical solution is to wait that societies go through, if I may say, the normal phases of development, such as urbanization, such as industrialization, such as uh, education. So as long as the, those societies lacked, lack these structural requirements, it is not logically, logically consistent to be optimist about the performance of agents, I mean uh, actors. In other words, what we have right now is a collapsed Arab, Arab system. There is no longer Arab system in the region, totally collapsed, almost collapsed. And I don't know if there is any reasonable literature that argues, that say to us that individuals have an option to change this setting to solve these problems. So the only solution that we should focus on is to wait that structural requirements or those societies to pass through that structural requirements, including Turkey. Why we cannot solve our democracy problem as of 2014? I think the only way is again to wait Turkey to pass through each periods of industrialization, urbanization, this and other. In other words, what is missing in the whole region, including Turkey, is the lack of experience in terms of going through all these periods that can only produce any kind of settled democracy. Thank you very much for listening.